it's my pleasure now to introduce our second panelist, also a good uh, friend, Luis Morino Ocampo, a hero in the struggle against impunity in Argentina. The first special prosecutor of the International Criminal Court involved in the great trials of the 21st century. A person who is the embodiment of integrity and excellence in the pursuit of international criminal justice. The only person that I know who has been named as amongst the bravest and the best of global thinkers in the 21st century. Luis. It's a real pleasure for me to join you in this march. I feel honored to be here with you. I'm sadly I cannot stay tomorrow, but I'd like to share some ideas with you. I like very much your comment, Robert, about the, the pessimist, but I like to be optimist because I like to show progress. There is progress. But the second point is in some way connected with what Robert said, keep progressing depend on us. And I will show that. Can you? Can you put the, I have a PowerPoint to show the progress. Okay, stay there. This, this is a graph developed by a professor, Kathleen Seeking. She's a professor at Harvard. And she identified a trend to make leaders of, who commit massive atrocities accountable for justice. She identified the beginning of the trend at Nuremberg. In this sense, Nuremberg was a landmark, not just because international justice, because the leaders were accountable for massive atrocities, for commit genocide, for exterminate millions of people, for kill the Jews. So before Nuremberg was considered a right of sovereign to kill the people in their country. After Nuremberg it was impossible. And then Catherine identified this trend, starting at Nuremberg, following in, in Europe, in Portugal and Greece, in particular in my country, Argentina, in 1985, when I had the honor to be one of the prosecutors in the Junta trial, and then follow with the international, going back, as Robert said, after the end of the Cold War, with the Yugoslavia and Rwanda as hoc tribunals, and then ending in, in creating Europe as a permanent court, the International Criminal Court. So this is a progress. The world is progressing. We are not sure how, how we keep progressing. That's a, that's a challenge for us. But until today, until today, the world is progressing. And I wish to show a few videos showing the connections. Show me the first. The chief prosecutor for the United States of America. This is the beginning of the first European trial. Robert Jackson. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive they are being repeated. Cannot survive. They are being repeated. So it's not a moral issue. It's a practical issue, survival. That was Robert Jackson talking at the opening statement of the first Nuremberg trial. As uh, Professor Barrett say, after the first Nuremberg were 12 American trials. And I'd like to show one of them, the Eisenhower Group case. I became the chief prosecutor for the United States in what was certainly the biggest murder trial in human history. We ask this court to affirm by international penal action man's right to live in peace and dignity regardless of his race or creed. The case we present is a plea of humanity to law. Where do 
Operative Group D operate. Gruppe D operiert in der südlichen Ukraine. Do you know how many persons were liquidated by Einsatz Group D and the other direction? Vom Juli 1941 bis äh, Juni 1942 sind von den Einsatzkommandos etwa 90.000 als liquidiert gemeldet worden. Stop there. This is the guy who is confessing to kill 70,000 people in one year. He's in the trial. So one of the important points of make trial to be sure what happened. This man is confessing 90,000 killings. And it's interesting. That's why I talk about leadership. Ben Ferencz, the prosecutor you saw, he was 27 in those days. In fact, his role at Nuremberg was just conducting investigations. And then he went to see Telford Taylor and said, look, I got this information. I have all these documents showing the Nazis killed one million people. Most of them Jewish, some anarchists, some gypsies. And then Telford Taylor said, we cannot do it. We're closing. We have no more lawyers to do the case. Ben said, but I have one million victims documented. So Telford Taylor told him, can you, do, can you do it yourself? Can you be the lawyer? Ben said, I never did a trial in my life. Okay, this will be your first trial. And it was his first trial, okay? And he did very well. In fact, he read his case in two days because he has all the documents, evidence. So, as Professor uh, uh, Sikin say, was the Nuremberg trial and then some national cases. And had the, I am proud because I was involved in one of them in Argentina in 1985. Can you show me the video? I think the junta trial was the first time when I had to face people who was against me. The lead in my country was in favor of the military dictatorship, so I had to face my family. This is a general. La ferocidad the same person in trial now. Son las dos notas he was in trial sistema de represión. Por eso hoy se hace necesario averiguar la verdad y juzgar a This todos me, los que hayan violado la ley, en particular a los poderosos, a los máximos responsables. And that, I, I spent all my life thinking that was my biggest achievement. I could know something bigger. But then they offered me to be the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And for me, as Robert said, the International Criminal Court is transforming Nurem into a permanent institution. And that's why what I did, I invited Ben Ferencz to help me in my closing, in, in closing argument in my first trial. Can you show me the next? Ferenc is sworn in as an honorary prosecutor of the ICC. They didn't give me much room for a signature here. Mr. Ferenc, you are part of this office now. We are honored, we are really honored to have you as well as the second. So this is the same 27 at Nuremberg, now 93 at the ICC. This is the last, this is the first trial of the ICC. May it please your honors. This is a historic moment. I am now in my 92nd year, having spent a lifetime striving for a more humane world governed by the rule of law. I am honored to represent the prosecutor regarding the significance of this trial. In Rome, over a hundred sovereign states decided that child recruitment were, and I'm quoting now from the statute, among the most serious crimes of concern for the international community as a whole. Vengeance begets vengeance. Seizing and training young people to hate and kill undermines the legal and moral firmament of human society. Let the voice and the verdict of this esteemed global court now speak for the awakened conscience of the world. Thank you. So I would suggest the institution is consolidated. We, we, sh we saw a picture of the new building. It's a permanent building, cost $400 million, that still would be there. So when I took office, the issue was existence. United States, Bush administration was trying to destroy the institution. Now it's not about existence, it's consolidated. The issue is relevance. But relevance will depend on each of us. 
Okay, I have a f show the map very quickly. These are the, because as Robert said, they are still the biggest countries are not there, but it's normal. Biggest people don't like law, they have their power. So this is an idea of the smaller countries, or the medium-sized countries, trying to establish a different standard. And that way, in blue, you have the countries who are members, in white, the non-members. So, probably. So, this is really the ICC jurisdiction. And, go, roll again. These countries are not. These countries can be referred by the Security Council, but not, are not members. So that's why it's still confused. Yes. So, well, but let me go back to the graphic. We are still progressing. In, in the top level, you see the trials. Below, you see the rules adopted. So we are progressing. But the real issue is, it's not about the court activities. Law is focused on court, but the real issue is the shadow of the court. A professor from Harvard, Bob Manukin, explained the board, most of the divorce are solved by lawyers who took the rule, they take the rules of the judges and solve the conflict under the shadow of the court. So the issue is that, the issue is how to expand the shadow. And shadow is not about judges and prosecutors. Shadow is about other actors. Uh, for me, it was, I learned today this, this fact that um, Professor Barrett explained that Robert Jackson, as, as Attorney General, issued a decision that was legal to sell so, uh, uh, munition and ships to UK. So that was a legal decision crucial to stop the crime by the Nazis. And it was an attorney general, it was not a, a prosecutor and a judge. Robert Ballinger was a minister of justice in, in France. He was critically important to adopt the ICC. So it's not just about judges and prosecutors, it's about other actors. I know here the minister of justice is Israel, and I know probably you're not happy with the ICC existence, but it's a reality. And for me, you are one of the champions in the future. You should see, you should define how, can, how the ICC existence can be used by Israel to increase its own security. That's your challenge. We'll be happy to support you, but that's your challenge. So we need leaders, diplomats and political leaders. And just to finish, when we were thinking, okay, how to present them in a good example, what type of leaders we need, what type of diplomat we need, is Raoul Wallenberg. No one could be better than Raoul Wallenberg to explain how a diplomat could save life. You know, Raoul Wallenberg went to Hungary and he was giving provisional passport to thousands of Jews that became Swedish. And in this sense, they saved their life. But looking for a more, I finish with this, looking for a more exact example, I found in the Cathy Martin book about Wallenberg, I found a good example of what a diplomat could do. And we need diplomats today to the Yazidi genocide. It's a, it's a genocide today ongoing. Women are still raped, sexual slaves by Islamic State. Kids are, Yazidi kids are forced to be soldiers. The US Congress, the US State Department, the European Union Parliament decide it's a genocide and we're not doing justice for them. We had to find a way to move the Yazidi case to the ICC, because Iraq is a white country, cannot do it itself. But to finish, let me go back to Wallenberg. And I found this line, Wallenberg was not just providing passport, he did incredible things. And let me read this line to explain what he could do, what he did from Cathy Martin book. On November 1944, the war was ending. This, the Soviet army was just miles from Budapest. However, SS Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann was still insisting to exterminate all the Hungarian Jews, the third largest and last surviving Jewish community in Europe. He was not able to keep using trains to send Jewish to the camps, but he had a new idea to force thousands of Jews to walk, to walk in the cold and rain of late fall. They were guarded by the Hungarian Gendarmerie. Eichmann was waiting for them in the Hungarian-Austrian border. And when this column of, people, of Jewish people were walking through the Austrian border, suddenly a young man arrived in a black car 
follow by Red Cross trucks. I am Wallenberg, Swedish legation, he said. In the name of the Hungarian government, I demand those with Swedish passport to raise them high. Immediately, he pointed to an astonished man waiting to his turn to be handed over to his executioners. And Gulenberg said, I recognize you. I give you a passport. And then you get behind him. He was taking driver license or birth certificate to, so fast as passport, so fast that the Nazi did not check. Eichmann did not enjoy public confrontations, and he preferred to say to do nothing. And then, when the Red Cross, the, the Red Cross trucks were full, Wallenberg jumped into his own car, and the humanitarian, humanitarian convoy left. Wallenberg was whispering, "I'm sorry to the thousand he was leaving behind." That's what we need today, more Wallenberg. Thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you, Luth, for reminding us of the important legacy of Nuremberg, of the principle of individual criminal accountability, of evoking Benjamin Ferenc of his plea of humanity to law and joining with you in the call of humanity to respect la primauté de droit, to respect the rule of law, and for your closing reference to Rao Wallenberg. You know, Adolf Eichmann referred to Rao Wallenberg as the Judenhung Wallenberg. Wallenberg the Jewish dog. But to the people that Wallenberg saved, he was regarded as the guardian angel. And there is an important message in all this, Lewis, as you concluded. That one person, like Rao Wallenberg, demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil, can resist, and can transform history. There is a message in that for all of us.